This is the first episode of the Network State Podcast. I've been on many podcasts. Uh, I guess they've had millions of views collectively, and I've probably had millions of people asking me to, when are you gonna do your own podcast? Well, we're doing it, okay? This podcast is about network states, of course, but it's also about everything we're interested in from the positive vision of human improvement to, uh, you know, obviously cryptocurrency, but also biotechnology, drones, nuclear power, and all the policies we need to actually legalize all of this amazing stuff. Um, and I'm going to be talking to tech people. I'm going to be talking to policy people. I'm going to be talking to interesting people and giving my own commentary and hopefully injecting some levity occasionally into the proceedings. Today, I'm actually uh, very happy to have our first guest here, my friend Vitalik Buterin, the uh, founder of Ethereum, here to talk to us today about Ethereum, about network states, and uh, starting new countries, and also how to improve yourself, as well as his uh, particular life hack, one weird trick that allowed him to learn Chinese in, in how long was it, Vitalik? I built like three years before I got comfortable enough to talk to people, yeah. There you go. One weird trick to learn Chinese in three years of hard work. So he'll tell you what he did. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Well, uh, we're underway. Um, this is the first Network State podcast. And uh, uh, obviously, you know, we've talked a lot about a bunch of things. Like rather than doing, you know, tell us about yourself and background and all this stuff, I will assume that that's on tons of other podcasts. I think what is maybe a little topical that we can just talk about is Ethereum from concept to the present day, because we just had the merge. And, uh, you know, what is Ethereum after the merge? What's the future? And, uh, you know, then what happens after that? Why, why don't you tell us about that? Sure. Uh, so, the Ethereum project uh, started around the end of uh, 2013. Uh, so what I had been doing before then was uh, I would basically finished a, well, not really finished, but uh, I was uh, about f five months into a uh, Bitcoin trip around the world. Uh, this was uh, basically something I had started in uh, June of that year, just uh, visiting what was the Bitcoin community at the time. So I uh, yeah, visited like the libertarians in New Hampshire, the uh, left-leaning anarchists in Spain, the uh, you know, more uh, kind of normy uh, Bitcoin community in uh, Switzerland and people in Israel who are working on math and uh, covered coins and zero-knowledge proofs and MasterCoin. I had uh, accumulated all of these uh, different ideas and uh, a lot of... Uh, interesting just recollections of various projects that people were working on. And uh, what was interesting in Israel in particular, right, was uh, there was this uh, really high density of people who were excited about this problem of, well, what's next, right? So we have Bitcoin for uh, payments. What is blockchain for, um, you know, finance, domain name systems, and more general applications are going to look like in general, right? And what would a protocol that could actually support those kinds of applications look like? The first uh, protocol that was uh, trying to do anything vaguely in that range was uh, Covered Coins, right? Which basically just allowed you to access other kinds of assets um, and uh, issue other kinds of assets, make sure it's actually look at the right other kinds of assets on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, but then after this, so there was a MasterCoin, which was a financial protocol that supported a couple of applications uh, that were called things like basically things that we would call DeFi today. So all the color coin stuff was in, uh, it was pre-2013 when people still thought all that stuff could run on Bitcoin. And then um, I think we met in late... 2013, if I recall, mm -hmm. right before yes. you started. We uh, met in uh, San Francisco, actually, right after this uh, trip to Israel, right where I had uh, started actually working on uh, covered coins and master coin. And uh, basically, right after I had started asking myself the question, like, okay, take these protocols as, uh, uh, as they are, what kinds of tweaks can you make to them? to try to make them support more things without making the protocols even bigger, right? Um, so I think um, at the time I uh, coined and was uh, using the term Swiss Army Knife Protocols. And uh, what I meant by that, right, was uh, something like MasterCoin. It supported 10 different types of applications, but it just had one transaction type for each application. You know, there was a transaction type for like registered domain. There was a transaction type for open binary financial contract. There was... Uh, 
you know, a, a transaction type for make a bet on an event with this third party um, as the arbitrator. I mean, and I started poking at these features to try to say, like, for example, oh, what happens if we collapse these three features into one feature that's like one feature and it's a little bit more complex, but it supports those applications and it supports even more applications. The rich statefulness. Exactly. Yep. So rich statefulness actually, ca actually came near the end, right? Uh, so at first I was just making these tiny tweaks. Then I realized, well, what if we made MasterCoin that had a feature for generic two-party financial contracts where you could specify a formula? And then after that, finally, uh, what happens if you go beyond two-party and you say, okay, well, what does an end-party contract look like? And that's when we had or these uh, big insights like, well, maybe it makes sense for a contract to actually be an account. What if it makes sense to to make it possible to send coins directly to a contract. So a contract is like an actual like virtual agent that you could interact with, that you could call, that you could uh, you know send coins to, uh, do all kinds of things with. And that's where the ideas for Ethereum started to emerge. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning, those ideas were phrased in the form of like, well, how do we modify some of these existing systems? But then as the yeah, momentum, uh, around the project uh, kind of grew as uh, more and more people started uh, getting interested in the yeah, idea, then it kind of, the ambition quickly grew and it quickly basically became a yeah, project to create a new and independent blockchain, right? So that's uh, kind of how things started. Right? And I yeah, had written this uh, big document uh, back in November of uh, 2013 that I refined a bit since then, but largely in November, the, yeah, Ethereum white paper, right? And uh, I think maybe even when we met for the first time, I might have tried showing it. I'm not even... I think there was V... It was basically the big room where there was a bunch of people there and actually several companies came out of it, actually including Blockstream. Everybody came in that room and I said, who are the founders? And everybody raised their hands. And I was like, okay, this is going to be this could be interesting. Um, and I remember there were, like, uh, there were quite a few folks on the early Ethereum. There was that uh, conference in San Francisco a few months later where... Um, I think it was the one where it was a coin summit or something like that in 2014. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Early 2014. It was like one of the yeah. first like sort of formal Bitcoin conference like things. And I think around that time, the whole thing was coming together. And uh, I, I mean, I think the white paper was out by then or close to out by then. I don't recall exactly when Maybe it was public around that time. I think it was out by then. Yeah. And so that's the beginning, right? And how much of that early roadmap you know, the Frontier, Homestead, Metropolis, Serenity, how much of that did you guys, in your view, did you stick to? What did you end up changing? Obviously, you know, getting to proof of stake was much harder than, or took took a while, but it, it's now out there. So what, what, you know, it's impossible to hit something on the first go and most people would be very happy to have, you know, with Ethereum, but what, what's your retro on the whole thing? Yeah, I think uh, what we ended up doing was uh, basically in the spirit of the original and if, Frontier, Homestead, Metropolis, uh, Serenity, yeah, separation, right? Uh, so the those four words, by the way, they were from a yeah, blog post uh, that was uh, published um, on the Ethereum blog uh, by, I think it was Vinay Gupta like back in early 2015, a bit before Ethereum launched, right? And basically the intended definitions of those four stages were that uh, Frontier was the launch of the chain, but when the chain was launched, it would be launched with like, very explicit um, you know, marketing and like understanding among everyone that this was still a beta chain and uh, Wild West, the Wild West. Brand. Exactly, yep. Wild West. Lots of things could change. Um, you know, the, this is the frontier. You know, the standard things that the Bankless people say in every episode. Yep. Um, and then Homestead was, would be a mm -hmm. milestone of getting like a little bit out of the woods of the Wild West, right? So basically, saying like, okay, you know, the chains run for a while. It's uh, survived it looks fairly stable so it's uh, okay to consider it a yes slightly more mature chain but then obviously we still keep improving things metropolis um actually this is the one difference uh, originally there was a goal that the ethereum foundation would create something called mist which was the ethereum web browser right, right? basically a web browser designed around the idea of uh, building and uh, you know using decentralized applications from inside of it. And uh, it was intended to contain things like an app store and uh, 
I think there were even ideas there at the beginning of uh, it, having a DAO that would manage the App Store. There would be uh, uh, you know, security-oriented features that could only happen because of the browser. There's just a lot of like really fascinating and advanced ideas. And I think most of that ended up not happening, right? Instead, like, you know, we have like browser wallets. So things like, uh, you know, MetaMask, the Brave Wallet, and uh, I think more and more new ones are st starting to pop up lately. The one thing that ended up not really happening, I think Metropolis ended up being kind of, well, first of all, split up into three stages, right? So uh, there was uh, Byzantium, Constantinople, and Istanbul, uh, the the three forks that happened um, between in, like, 2018 and 2020, right? And uh, like Istanbul was the bigger one. It added uh, support for pairings, the cryptographic operation that makes a lot of the zero-knowledge proof protocols possible. And then some other features that were enabled by yeah, the other two. Um, and then in 2020, uh, EAP 1559, that was uh, something that was totally not predicted initially, but uh, it ended up actually being the first like really significant change to the Ethereum protocol, right? Basically, the um, idea there was it's a reform to the fee market. So to what, ha uh, what happens between you sending a transaction and that transaction getting included in a block, uh, and the process for like deciding which transactions get included, how much do miners get paid for including those transactions, what are the limits for how many transactions can get included, all of those different variables. And basically, yeah, it's uh, like the uh, kind of econom uh, geek uh, explanation is that it moves the fee market away from being a first price auction, which is known to be inefficient, and it moves it toward being a fixed price system. Mm -hmm. um, but one other way of uh, thinking about it is it adds like some temporary slack to the block space. So if there is very temporary growth and demand, uh, one block could be a little bit bigger, the next block could be a little bit smaller. And what these things ensure is basically that uh, if you like users don't have to make this really complicated calculation of uh, am I going to pay a, a, high, a very high fee and get included immediately or am I going to pay a lower fee and like needlessly wait five or 10 minutes? And instead, uh, what EAP 1559 basically gave us is a fee market where transactions would reliably get included in the next like one or two blocks, right? And then after that, we had the merge, which uh, I, I haven't gotten to that quite yet, but I'll kind of uh, poke into the the future of the past here briefly, the yeah, merge would uh, obviously switch us to proof of stake. But one of the interesting side effects was that it made block times more regular, right? Instead of a yeah, Poisson distribution where you had like a one twelfth of a chance of a block every second, with the merge, it's like a consistent rhythm, right? Block, 12 seconds, block, 12 seconds, block. And that actually yeah, meant that because of this extra regularity in block time, blocks would happen like, on average, you actually have to wait uh, two times less before uh, seeing the next block, even though the average time between blocks is, uh, is exactly the same. It's this really interesting mathematical artifact, right? And that kind of stacked on top of EAP1559, right? Because EAP1559 reduced how long users have to wait before they get included. And then the merge reduced that even further. Mm -hmm. And so the both of those two things together, like I think the effects of them both were just so visible. The difference is night and day, right? Like sending a transaction and waiting for it to get included back in 2019 was like a very frustrating experience. And today it's like, click, wait, um, check ether scan, it's done. Click, wait, check ether scan, it's done, right? Mm -hmm. It's like very often a yeah, transaction gets included uh, within only a few seconds. Like I think uh, probably yeah, you, you get a 50% chance after sending a transaction that it'll get included in less than about seven seconds or so, right? The only reason why it's not six is just uh, the probability that like wh whoever the next block creator is just happens to be doing uh, something weird and you have to wait for the next one. So UX improved, um, Ethereum clients improved. This is also a really important one, right? In uh, 2016, there are, so everyone knows ab uh, about the DAO and I think, uh, you know, the DAO is fascinating and the DAO is kind of fa uh, fascinating for a pro protocol politics perspective because there are all of these debates about how, you know, is immutability like in uh, 
an unlimited strong rule that you stick to in every situation? Like, uh, is it like a kind of fiat justitia periat mundus sort of thing? Uh, that's uh, a Latin phrase for like, let there be justice and uh, even though the heavens uh, fall, let the world perish. Yep. Um, or might there be like extreme case limits on it? And uh, you know, there was a debate of like, would that end up setting a precedent? And I think the answer to that actually ended up being much less than people thought, right? Because uh, a year later, there was uh, another dispute, uh, this uh, EAP 999, where the uh, parody team tried to unstuck their coins and, and like make a hard fork to do that. And the community just said, like, hell no, like we, uh, no, we actually explicitly don't want to create a precedent and, uh, or we explicitly don't want the DAO to become a precedent. And so they yeah, kind of intentionally went in the other direction. And since that, there haven't been really any attempts to uh, violate immutability to anything like uh, what uh, ha um, happened with the DAO. But I want to just ask one question on EIP-1559 because I do remember this and now I'm actually looking at it again. And it looks like the big difference is before it was an auction, which was in, uh, well, first a first price auction as opposed to like a second price victory auction is suboptimal. But the second thing is it just introduces noise and unpredictability into everything because you have a fee market and so on. And it looks instead that you went to a protocol set base fee so that if you pay that base fee, you're guaranteed of being included. And so the unpredictability is somewhat decreased. And I'm looking also at block times and they've also flattened out and the variance has gone down since the merge. It was a little bit more variance before the merge. Um, is that correct or am I am I off base on that? Yep, yep, no, both, but both are very correct. Okay, great. And actually it's interesting because um, I, I, you know, I, I had known about EIP 1559. I hadn't like tracked it closely, but it's interesting to see that that combination of things um, is what has been responsible for kind of faster and more predictable uh, transaction fee inclusion. On the DAO, um, do you want my perspective on the outside, just watching the whole DAO thing? I, I didn't oh, sure. comment on it. For, hear that. Go ahead. Yeah. So mm -hmm. first is during the DAO, you were the, and for those folks who don't know, because this is now ancient history in crypto terms, it's seven years ago, it's 2016 when Ethereum was, I think, Bitcoin was starting to hit congestion problems and a bunch of folks were checking out Ethereum in early 2016 and it had gotten up to a billion in valuation, I think thereabouts in early 2016. There was this project, the DAO, that was trying to do effectively uh, an on-chain VC fund, um, but it was trying to be autonomous and so on. Even the name DAO is probably arguably antiquated. It would be a really, it's not really an autonomous community and uh, it's, uh, we're not autonomous organization. And so from the outside, what happened was, I think it was like 10% or something of all ETH was in the DAO. Was that right? It was um, actually, it was 11 and a half million ETH, which is uh, a bit under 10% of the ETH that exists today, but it was, I think, 14% of the ETH that existed back then. Okay. So it was like a big chunk. And so what happened was this, uh, you know, DAO attacker, uh, read the code and figured out some way to sort of drain the the DAO contract. But there was this thing where there were like a there's like a white hat approach which could keep going back and forth and keep like undoing his thing. And that was just going back and forth. And I think there was like a 30 day clock or something before you before it was like a final transaction or something like that. Was that is that right? And then you were going to get in a patch before that 30 day clock went up to stop those funds from being moved somewhere. Am I remembering that correctly? Yep. yep ballpark. And so the thing about that was, I remember from the outside watching that, I was like, you know, now I have sympathy for Bernanke because there was a systemic risk to the whole system. And this sort of intervention could save the system potentially, but would it create moral hazard and so on and so forth or what have you. And I, I, I just understood in the same way that when you start a company, you're a CEO and you understand what it is to be CEO or you, you teach a class and you're a professor, you understand what it is. And you're like, okay, now I know what a smart ass kids were on, the, were on the other side, right? Being actually in the position of essentially central banker, you're like, okay, I now understand why, you know, they're there. Did you have those thoughts at that time? Or was that something you were thinking about? Mm. I don't think I uh, used uh, Bernanke as an analogy, but like, I guess just because, um, you know, the, those kinds of like monetary and finance issues are probably a little bit less of a primary category for me than sure. they are for a lot of the other earlier crypto people, but definitely similar thoughts. It's it's interesting because, I mean, ultimately the justification on it is that Ethereum has succeeded and that there hasn't been, despite significant pressure, other sort of reversal things put into Ethereum. Like, of course, there was that unfortunate hack of uh, the parity wallet for example. And then they were trying to get an EIP in there, I believe, to like move the funds or whatever. But so far, while that's very unfortunate, 
I don't think there has been another thing that's like that, that is like allowing for community reversals of transactions. So that means now we have stable governance. I guess we're out of Homestead fully. And, you know, uh, was it formally in Homestead around the time of the Dow? Uh, yes. So Homestead happened in March 2016 and uh, the Dow got hacked on, I believe it was June 17th, 2016. Yeah. So it's still basically, it's still basically beta. So that's, I think, a fairly good mm -hmm. justification yeah. for beta versus prod as to, you know, when edits up. So now, now we're mm -hmm. post-merge. I mean, and I was... Um, I was right. just crossing my fingers. Um, actually, before we get yeah. to post merge, I yeah, I kind of wanted to talk a bit about the <laughs> other thing that happened in 2016, just because I think right. it's uh, it's equally fascinating, but like ten times fewer people have heard of it. Mm -hmm. um, so okay, so the time is uh, 2016 September 19th, um, and it, the yeah, background of this time was that the Dow had uh, gotten hacked months ago. And the uh, Dow hard fork that had uh, like be done that kind of surgical intervention to the chain to just like delete the Dow coins and move them into this other place uh, ha had happened about two months ago. The whole situation where the Ethereum classic community rebelled and made their own version of Ethereum um, had, that refused to implement that change had happened. And the entire kind of market drama where, um, you know, you had... Uh, Barry Silbert pulp push, trying to push Ethereum Classic really hard, a whole bunch of characters kind of buying in early, trying to get it to flip Ethereum. Uh, when you had uh, a, a whole bunch of exchanges uh, supporting it, a whole, all, all, just a whole bunch of people really like watching and seeing, you know, which of these two chains would win because this was uh, the first time there was uh, any kind of like literal crypto civil war between uh, two chains. So that that had all happened. And the ETC price had hit a maximum of you know, 0 0.4 ETH, and then it had dropped again. Um, and it had dropped, I think, a bit below 0 0.1 at the time. And it just felt like maybe, just maybe, you know, the Ethereum community was finally on its way out from the being in the kind of DAO arc of uh, the plot of the story. But then at... Uh, 5.15 a.m. Uh, Shanghai time on September the 19th when I was uh, staying in the uh, uh, hotel where the uh, con uh, DevCon 2 was uh, literally about to start in uh, three hours and 45 minutes. I uh, got this uh, military style wake up call, like just uh, woken up by a call. I uh, picked it up and uh, someone from the Ethereum Foundation had said, hey, you know, we have a situation. You need to come down now. So I pretty much stood up, grabbed my computer, um, put my get, get computer in my yeah, computer bag, um, you know, walked out of the hotel room, uh, elevator down, walked over to this uh, room where I was supposed to go. And I saw about you know, 20 Ethereum developers gathered in a room. And uh, at that time, they were still trying to figure out what was going on. Basically, what had actually happened was that someone discovered a bug not in the Ethereum protocol, but in Ethereum implementations that would cause it to process a particular type of transaction much more slowly. Like basically, right. yeah, instead of uh, taking like n steps to process a transaction that had n computational steps in it, in this one particular case, it would take n squared steps, right? Basically, because it was like each s single step of the EVM would add one extra thing that the that the, the node would need to worry about. Um, and the, and so the first thing you would need in the first step would need to worry about one thing and the second step would need to worry about two things and third steps would you worry about three things, right? And so it went quadratic. Like this kind of bug could totally have happened. Actually, a, a, a quadratic bug actually did happen in Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the yeah, justifications for not, in, one of the secondary justifications for not increasing the Bitcoin block size uh, back when the Bitcoin block size debate had happened, this was uh, one of these like techno wog things that um, again almost uh, no one knows about, right? Is the uh, quadratic attack issue with hashing. So the quadratic attack issue with hashing in Bitcoin basically uh, yeah, it is I think it's I think it still is, but um, the only for old style transactions uh, segregated with this fixed it. But basically, that if you have a transaction that has n inputs then to compute the hash that gets used for the signature in each of the inputs, you have to hash the whole transaction. 
Right? So if you have n inputs and each of those n inputs need n different signatures, you have to create n different hashes and each of those hashes contain, um, you know, at least kind of like the structure of all of those inputs. Um, and so each of those hashes would be size n. Um, and so you would have n hashes of size n in order to sign a uh, size n transaction. So you need O of n squared hashing, right? And because Bitcoin is just, like because it was just hashing and not EVM execution, and because Bitcoin just has lower absolute limits to its capacity, it ended up being, I think, okay for Bitcoin as it is. Like a worst case block at that time, I think ended up taking like 30 seconds to process. But if the block size had increased, that would go up quadratically, right? So if the block size has gone up from one to 10, then the, uh, uh, the worst case block time would have gone up from 30 seconds to 3000 seconds, which is almost an hour, right? right. So, so, so it's not a Turing completeness issue, right? It's uh, a quadrat, like literally Bitcoin also had a quadratic execution uh, issue and that ended up influencing at least to, to, to a slight extent, I think it ultimately happened for other reasons, the yes, small block versus big block discussion. In the Ethereum case, it was, uh, it had to do with the implementation and way, the way that the system handled recursive calls or, or just like long towers of calls in general. So like A calls B calls C, or it could be A calls A calls A. Um, and how it created, like basically when it created a call, the VM ended up copying everything and the, the, the amount of stuff that got copied uh, kept increasing with every call. Um, so there are actually a whole bunch of these different uh, quadratic execution attacks. Uh, so the attacker discovered the first one in uh, at you know, early morning uh, Chinatown time of September the 19th. Um, I think the yeah, attacker might have even intended to kind of create a nasty surprise and basically make the Ethereum chain break on the morning of DEF CON. Ouch. Right? Uh, but we yeah, ended up uh, working um, you know, really yeah, hard and really intensely for those few hours. We had, uh, by about 6.30 a.m., I think, um, isolated the bug uh, by like maybe 7 a.m. or so, created the patches that would fix the bug. Um, and then, That's pretty legit. That's but, hard to do for a subtle bug that's actually quite difficult go ahead it, it absolutely was yeah and then uh, by uh, like 8 30 a.m we had like uh, i think published the uh, patches and people were starting to download them and at 9 25 a.m 25 minutes after the intended start of the conference uh we uh, were all kind of confident enough that everything was stable people were running the new nodes everything uh, was uh, working as expected and the network was uh, running fine again and the conference uh, ba basically started uh, pretty much as it had uh, been planned to start, right? So we had turned a, uh, in a basically an attempt at creating a PR disaster for us, I think, uh, you know, into something that really showed the uh, unity and the, uh, well, just the dedication and the competence of the uh, Geth developer team, right? I think uh, it's uh, one of the other reasons why I kind of wanted to tell um, the story, which by the way is not done yet, um, is uh, that uh, you know, like the core devs really are these kind of unsung heroes of the ecosystem, and they tend to be more introverted and they tend to be less podcasty than um, you know myself or Justin. But they've just done a lot uh, to make Ethereum uh, the Ethereum clients faster and to really enable like let's say the yes seven x capacity increase that the chain has had uh, since. Uh, uh, since it launched, right? But uh, it took a long time to get there, right? So that was the first attack. And then when DEF CON finished on the evening of the third day, the attacker discovered a second attack. Hmm. A few days later, the attacker discovered a third attack. There was a fourth attack. Oh, wow. If, there was literally this month long period where we were literally in constant cyber war between the Geth and Parity development teams. A Geth and Parity were the two Ethereum clients yep. that were functional at the time. And there would be often periods where either Geth worked and Parity did not work or Parity worked and Geth did not work. And a lot of users ended up switching between the two clients so really frequently. Um, and the two teams were both just like frantically putting out fires that this attacker was starting. The attacker was figuring out every single bug in e each of these Ethereum clients. It's a pretty smart guy, or that attacker was. Yeah, yeah, he was uh, really impressive, right? And then uh, finally, a month later, he discovered a bug which was not in the implementation, but in the protocol itself, right? Um, this was a bug with the uh, self-destruct opcode that basically allowed it to be used to do some... Uh, 
really but basically make the Ethereum state much, much bigger using a very tiny amount of gas. And that and that bug, had it been left alone, like it would have been fatal uh, within some number of uh, weeks, right? Because basically the Ethereum state size was just bloating up. And uh, once the Ethereum state size bloats up too much, then there would just be no way to do any kind of caching, and that would make Ethereum even slower in other ways. There, we had to do another hard fork, another emergency unexpected hard fork to increase the gas costs of a couple of operations to just make those uh, um, attacks just not viable in the future. Do you remember that? And uh, do you remember the second hard fork that uh, uh, added a feature to clean up all of the junk um, uh, state objects that the attacker added into the Ethereum chain? Um, and I remember basically that at the end of 2016 in December, like Ethereum's price had dropped quite a bit over the course of years, being like a long slide down. People were demoralized after the Dow and the multiple hard forks. And people thought that the, uh, this is not you, but folks, you know, like who are in the broader crypto community or whatever thought, okay, smart contracts are just too hard and just add too much complexity and too much attack surface. It's going to be a while before this thing works and, you know, much, much power to them, but it'll probably take a few years. Then three months, four months later, you have this gigantic rise and it's like, uh, you know, we should play that rap thing, you know, where the guy's like on his back and he kind of gets up like that. Do you know the meme I'm talking about? Uh, we'll, we'll put this in the show edits. Go ahead. Yeah. The, but, you know, the, the, the drama was not, was, uh, not, not quite over, as you said, until December, right? Um, at the end of November, there was this situation where like, I had to send a bunch of transactions uh, to, we basically wrote a Python script to send thousands of transactions to clear out this junk that the attacker had uh, added into the chain. Um, into the chain. And, like, and one of those transactions triggered another bug that had uh, accidentally been introduced that actually for the first and only time, like really act proper, like actually had a consensus failure. Like s same thing as what happened in uh, Bitcoin in 2013, kind of split the chain in half. Um, like I was the one who sent a, uh, tr the, the transaction that like basically broke Ethereum in that way for the first and only time, which was uh, one of these, uh, a kind of f fun stories again. But yeah, after all that, the price had been dropping and everyone was uh, definitely demoralized. And then 2017 happened and, uh, you know, the crazy bubbles of 2017 happened. Then 2018 happened and uh, 2019 happened and people in Ethereum were demoralized again. The yeah, end of 2018 was uh, the birth of Uniswap, which I think was a good uh, kind of segue into the DeFi era. And then in 2020, we have the summer of DeFi and uh, then you know, it started to be NFTs. NFTs are probably the one thing that I did not predict, by the way, right? Like if you look at the list of applications that were in the Ethereum white paper and you look at the applications that are popular today, the big thing that's in the second list that's not the first is uh, NFTs. But uh, Otherwise, you know, there are prediction markets, yep. there are DeFi, there are a lot of things, right? Um, and then finally, um, you know, this uh, last year, 2022, the merge happened and that was Serenity, right? Serenity was always intended to be proof of stake. And f later on, we added on sharding, the, uh, basically some kind of scaling solution to that. Um, and, uh, you know, proof of stake has finally happened. Congratulations right? on that. So, can, can I say why I was concerned about that? I was, I was just, sure. I was obviously, you know, rooting for the success and everything, but I was like, you know, a full switchover of the, uh, uh, of course, consensus had been tested for about a year or thereabouts, but you're moving the whole ecosystem over and it was a, everything that isn't tested is usually where bugs arise. And so the fact that that was as smooth as it was and basically a non-event and that they're hasn't been, I mean, maybe there's something that eventually, but, but it's certainly nothing at the time, nothing in the few weeks afterwards was really impressive. It was, um, it's one of those back end changes where the whole point is that it's a non-event, but a very, very, very difficult to pull off. So congratulations on that. Um, I, you probably have some thoughts on, on that whole transition over. Yeah. I mean, the transition took a lot of work, right? Like, uh, I think it actually surprised all of us that the yeah, transition was a non-event to the extent that it was right. Because every single test run that we had attempted had at least one right. thing, tiny thing break in it. Like n never anything bad enough that like it would have been a big problem had it happened on the on the live network. But it was always like some combination of client settings ended up not surviving, and like ten percent of the nodes dropped off. One time, thirty five percent of the nodes dropped off, and that actually caused finalization mm -hmm. to delay by an hour. 
there's just like always a couple, one or two tiny things that would break. And then when the you know, real merge finally happened, you know, everything yeah. just went extremely smoothly, right? And I think that again, you know, it's just is a testament to the quality of, um, you know, the uh, all of the Ethereum client development teams that uh, worked hard for multiple years to write the software that would make the uh, transition to proof of stake possible, right? And basically pull off something that I think uh, some people were describing as changing the engine of a jet while the jet was still flying, right? It's a pretty, really complicated operation. I mean, it, like a lot of people, I think, definitely did believe that it couldn't be done, but, um, you know, eventually it was done. Um, so... So now that the merge is done, and uh, I, I think uh, the main thing that's left for the uh, for in the original kind of roadmap is uh, sharding, right? And sharding is something that we talked about for a long time. But I think the uh, ideas around how sharding would be implemented have changed. It's gotten more ambitious, right? Like early versions of sharding were willing to trust honest majority assumptions and basically were willing to trust the idea that. Uh, like let's assume 50% of the yeah, nodes are going to be good people, which uh, is, is like a lot less ambitious than like say the Bitcoin spirit, right? Which basically says that, uh, you know, hey, even if 90% of buyers are pushing the wrong chain, you as an operator of a node should be able to reject it, right? Like Bitcoin is not a minor oligarchy. It's like a constitutional system where it's supposed to only accept things that are valid. And... The original vision for Ethereum sharding had been like, okay, fine, no, obviously we have to trust that 50% are going to be honest. But then we started being more ambitious and saying like, oh, can we actually make a system that supported many more transactions that a single node could verify, but that was still verifiable in the sense that the system would still kind of force itself to follow the rules and where users could verify the rules are being followed, even if a great majority of the consensus participants we're trying to subvert that objective, right? And there's a lot of really interesting research, and uh, one of the big and uh, I think faithful. So, so what percentage would be trying to subvert in that case? So, not even like what's the honest? It's not the honest majority anymore. It's the honest fraction of what? Yeah, you know, right. So we had like an honest minority assumption in uh, some of our protocols that basically required like the user and maybe a few hundred other uh, other. So clients, a fixed number, like, not, not even a fixed like, percentage. Basically, no. Or am I right? Right, exactly. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, I actually, yeah. I should look at that. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but uh, one of the fateful decisions that we made around 2020, um, this is, I think, another one of these uh, trivia that, uh, that is well known within Ethereum circles, but probably does, hasn't really kind of filtered out to the, uh, you know, the wider narrative meme, uh, meme plex is uh, the roll-up centric roadmap, right? This is basically this idea that, uh, instead of Ethereum itself trying to kind of boil the ocean with uh, scaling and uh, turn itself into this complicated hyperscalable system, we would make some changes to Ethereum that would make it be more friendly to people making layer two scaling solutions, right? So layer two scaling solutions are like protocols that try to do the same thing that Ethereum does, but that plug into Ethereum for security without doing every single thing on top of Ethereum, right? So most of the work would happen off-chain, but just enough work would or could be done on-chain that if something happens, the Ethereum system would kind of keep the rest of the system honest, right? So one of the yeah, defining analogies for layer twos in general is yeah, like the concept Supreme of court. a court, yep. right? Like the concept of a, exactly. The Supreme Court is uh, what things are kind of ultimately yeah, uh, rest on, but you don't literally have the Supreme Court hearing every single case, right? You have a whole bunch of these uh, appeals courts and like a whole bunch of lower courts. And then you just have the facts that the threat of a court uh, case being possible uh, can uh, drive honest behavior without uh, most of uh, that behavior ever needing to get into a court system, right? That kind of analogy uh, like drives the Lightning Network, which is basically the only kind of layer two that's uh, possible on uh, Bitcoin. And it also drives, uh, you know, state channels, which are like the Lightning Network equivalents on Ethereum, as well as rollups, which are this more complicated thing that was only discovered later on Ethereum that are actually powerful enough that you could do smart contracts on top of them, right? So Lightning Network and state channels support transactions and they support uh, very limited kinds of uh, contracting. The rollups, they support like kind of full on EVMs that are that kind of get indirectly verified inside the EVM. 
Um, so layer twos um, have kind of been the Ethereum scaling direction since then. And since then, there have been these discussions around data availability, right? Basically, the the practical capacity limit to a layer two is how much data the uh, Ethereum chain uh, chain itself can store, right? Because uh, one of the trade-offs of rollups is that they do require the Ethereum chain to store a few bytes of data for every single transaction, like a lot less than uh, using Ethereum directly, but still a, a some amount of data. Um, and that's where stuff like data availability sampling and EIP 4844, which is uh, looking um, scheduled to come, um, you know, early to mid, uh, you know, maybe maybe later next year, is is all about exactly. So the re- I mean, well, proto dank sharding is like a bit of a pun, right? Because uh, so first there's sharding, and then there is dank sharding, which is uh, this uh, v- version of uh, sharding, which was. Uh, created by an Ethereum uh, researcher named Dankrad. And then there is proto-dank sharding, which is called that because it's a stepping stone to full dank sharding. It doesn't technically shard data yet, though it does shard history and computation. Um, but it was also uh, created by another Ethereum researcher oh, whose funny. name is proto-lambda, right? Uh, so yeah, so proto-dank sharding happening next year. And the other thing that, um, like I've talked to the roll-up team said they all want to do next year is they want to start taking off training wheels, right? So the rollups and uh, layer twos that exist on Ethereum today, they basically all have what I call training wheels, like some kind of backdoor that lets developers uh, come in and like say stop and change the protocol if they see that some kind of bug has happened. And like training wheels are obviously a, uh, you know, an affront to the moral idea of trustlessness and um, all of those things. And nobody wants training wheels to be the status quo long term. But basically, yeah, they're like a compromise saying, OK, people um, like we want to hit the ground running and we want applications to be able to start, um, you know, start deploying on layer twos before we can be fully confident that the thing, that the thing has no bugs. And so we're going to have a backdoor for a while. And then once uh, things are stabilized and once we're confident enough in the code, then we can finally start That's taking great. the backdoors out. Right. And uh, so next year, I, yeah, some of the projects uh, are going to actually, I, I think might be actually taking their backdoors out. Some of them are going to be kind of limiting their backdoors and going to a hybrid, right? Where a backdoor exists, but there's like, it, it's not like one person that, that that manages it. And it's not even a multi-sig with a 51% threshold. It's like a multi-sig with an 80% threshold or a 75% threshold with members that are like highly distributed between, uh, between a bunch of different organizations. And so it's like a halfway house between, uh, you know, being a yeah kind of, trusted sidechain uh the in the style of um, you know something like liquid or in the style of something like polygon today versus being a fully decentralized system right where it's like you know the humans have half the votes and the code has half the votes that's probably mm-hmm. one sort of mathematically accurate way to think about it and so if like you the want, senate like, in the house if you want to override uh, the code you know right. exactly like if the uh you know, if even a majority of the humans are dishonest, as long uh, like unless you know you have like almost all the humans are dishonest, like if it's just a majority, then you know the code still kind of car- uh, carries the day, right? But so the idea would be that if there is some political controversy, uh, that then you know you're not gonna you know you could see yourself getting fifty one percent of the humans, but um, you know you're not gonna get like eighty percent of the humans, whereas if it's a bug, then like that's something where it's easy to get like a you know hundred uh, percent uh, even agreement that that the bug needs to be fixed. you know, not total uh, kind of uh, you know take the training wheels off and leave it to the code, but like a very large step toward that. Um, and actually, yeah, I, one of the teams I talked to actually is more ambitious than even that. One of the, the, their approach is to basically say, we're going to have a system where we only turn on the humans when someone submits a proof that the code disagrees with itself. So if the code can create a valid proof for something that's valid and, and, hmm. and for something that's invalid, then it's inconsistent. And so um, you switch to humans. Yep. Like, exactly. If you make a proof of inconsistency, right, which is much easier than a proof of incorrectness, like basically just show that it provides two different answers to the same question, right? Like, uh, 
you know, if like if I ask uh, Chad GPT, you know, who was the president of the United States in 1850 and I ask it 10 times and one of those times it gives a different answer, like that's that by itself is proof that yep. that it's not, you know, a, a perfect system, just like even to someone yep. who knows nothing about U.S. history. Right. It's like that kind of idea. Um, so but this is all like I think the details of that are still being figured out. But like the thing that everyone is dead set on is that 2023 is going to be the year when, um, you know, roll-ups really come to maturity. We have 4844 that gives roll-ups more space. And we have uh, the trading wheels on roll-ups like really get weakened um, a lot. Um, and like basically, yeah, uh, we go most of the way to these... Uh, uh, you know, Ethereum scaling being this kind of fully trustless, and uh, so not fully trustless, but you know, most of the way to being fully trustless, so most we tr most we trustless uh, system that kind of gets us to like most of uh, you know what we would call sharding being finished, and then after that there is uh, rollups going fully trustless, and then there is full dank sharding, and I think those things are going to take a couple of years longer, but like for me personally, I think after the changes in next year, like. That would be the point, the first point where I would feel comfortable saying, even if nothing else happened past that point, I would be happy with Ethereum, right? And that to me is like a, the, 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 like a, my, yeah, like that, that's the personal milestone for me, right? Like the, yeah, you know, equivalent of, uh, like, when can we call Ethereum done if we really have to call it done? Well, end of 2023, right? So merge done, withdrawals done. Uh, so be, being able to withdraw from the proof of stake system, um, you know, basic scaling done, um, a lot, uh, you know, a lot of basic improvements done, um, enough cryptography added to Ethereum that we can support privacy, uh, solutions as a layer on top. And, you know, if we need to, we can stop there, but at the, you know, we're not going to stop there. Right. And we want to kind of like go ahead and uh, try to actually make sure that the Ethereum ecosystem gets support 500 million users before, um, you know, the bull where 500 million users are knocking on the door actually, yeah, you know, ends up happening. That's right? great. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, that, that. Yeah, that, so that's the, that, that, that's probably the next part of the future, you know, the transition from Ethereum as this kind of the very theoretical ecosystem that's still discovering and finding itself to Ethereum as an ecosystem that actually is, you know, tries to be useful and usable and, uh, you know, secure and, uh, and all those things and like actually provide value for hundreds of millions of people. Here's a question which you can skip if you want, but... Um... Basically, in terms of Ethereum being done, so you mentioned, you know, the trustlessness, um, you know, some folks have talked about like the OFAC compliant blocks due to, you know, the whole MEV issue. Others have said, oh, when are, when are we going to be able to withdraw Ethereum from staking? Um, do you have any thoughts on, and then the third is basically, you know, I think Zuko has mentioned that it'll be hard to have privacy completely bolted onto Ethereum if it's not there at the base layer. And I, I think I might agree with that third one. But maybe do you have any thoughts on those three or do you not want to address those or um, go ahead? I, mean, I, th I think they're definitely yeah, important issues. So withdrawals are the easiest one. Like it's uncontroversial. Everyone agrees that it's going in the next hard fork, which is uh, I think expected okay. to happen early next year. Um, on the like privacy and uh, censorship resisted stuff, I mean, it's uh, there's definitely like a big bundle of uh, problems that um, I think the yeah, Ethereum ecosystem is facing at the same time that are important, right? So it's uh, like basically one of the things that's happened over the last year, few years is the rise of MEV. Um, and MEV, like one simple way to, get to think about it is it's like the facts that there exist strategies for um, miners or block proposers or whoever creates the block to make even more money where those strategies are complex and require you to have like complex algorithms to be able to execute on them, right? So it's basically the fact that like being a really dumb automaton is no longer the optimal strategy for a yeah, block builder. The, the challenge is like, how do we prevent that fact from being a source of centralization um, where, you know, let's say, yeah, staking ends up centralizing into like two or three pools that uh, get, become better than everyone else at actually yeah, implementing these algorithms, right? So that discussion started happening in around 2019 um, and uh, flashbots came out uh, around that time. And then at the same uh, 
at the same time, you know, there, there definitely yeah, were mining pools that were independently thinking about how like they would try to extract this extra MBV revenue as pools. Um, so the, that was one of the, the things that happened. And uh, the way that we ended up solving that uh, problem is basically this concept of proposer builder separation, right? Where instead of uh, the uh, whoever creates the block, the uh, proposer, uh, being able to or needing to uh, figure out the contents of the block themselves, they can auction that off to third parties, right? And uh, they can basically uh, run an auction and they can uh, accept bids that say, hey, here's an idea I have for what to include in a block. And if you include this um, or, or, you know, I'll let, let you include uh, this and uh, collect the fees. And uh, if, if you let me do that, I'll pay you 0.018 ETH. And someone else might say, oh, here's a, another block uh, that I have. And if you include this, I'll pay you 0.022 ETH, right? And there's like a lot of complexities around how to make that kind of market fair for all participants and like make it decentralized and uh, resistance to cheating and attacks on all, on all sides without the resistance to, or without the anti-cheating itself turning into a centralization vector. Um, but one of the uh, things that happened as a result of uh, this is basically that, uh, you know, we ended up outsource, like block proposers ended up outsourcing too much, right? Like it, you don't actually need to outsource the entire process of block creation if all you want to do is to capture MEV revenue. And the problem with outsourcing the entire process of block creation is that we've moved block creation from this uh, set of more distributed um, actors to this set of more concentrated actors. And more concentrated actors are inevitably going to be much more legally conservative and uh, even more likely to over comply um, in the terms of what kinds of transactions uh, they are accepting, right? Like basically we now have uh, about 70% of uh, block of the uh, builders that are creating, uh, that are cr uh, actually responsible for constructing blocks that are going into the chain that are refusing to include certain kinds of transactions. Like I've actually, you know, I've even t like talked to legal counsel that think that they're going too far and that they're even, you know, blocking uh, trans uh, transactions to an, extent that we're, uh, to an extent where they don't need to, right? But you know, the fact that they are centralized actors, the fact that, you know, even lots of them are, you know, based in the US, so the fact that they are actors that are connected to other actors and all of these things, right? Like it ends up kind of pushing uh, things over to the, uh, you know, to this uh, conservative side that, like, you know, goes beyond what a lot of uh, you know, legal counsel have even, you know, have even, even told me is legally necessary. And uh, so the good news is that nothing has been censored in Ethereum, right? So the good news is that even tr the transactions of the type that people are being most conservative about uh, trying to censor, those transactions can still, on average, get included into the chain after about three blocks, right? Uh, so... Actually, yeah, post EAP one, like basically EAP one five five nine did more to make those trans, uh, to make those transactions faster to include than the whole MEV situation Actually, did there, to make them slower to include. Is there something Which that's like a just, warrant canary for uh -huh. Ethereum transaction censorship? Like, could you? Uh, there's probably something there, but I, I, maybe I just don't know the site that's just looking at the mempool or uh, and seeing that there aren't blocks or there aren't transactions with valid high amounts of fees that aren't making it in. So the yes, the canonical site for this is uh, mevwatch.info. That's uh, actually the site where I pulled the seventy percent. Yeah, I do remember from. this: the OFAC compliant blocks, the, the at the top, right? But the censorship offenders yeah, it yeah. says censored. So it does actually claim that some of them are censoring. These entities run censoring MEV relays on their validators. Yeah, but and it's improved. Is, like, there's so a that's lot interesting. I had not seen this graph at the bottom. Probably, right? The post merge daily. O so. So it looks like green is increasing, which is interesting and a little bit counterintuitive. Is, is it your view that that's going to continue to increase or that green is large enough that that's the free Ethereum for a while and it just needs to be large enough? Or how, how do you think about that? I think we're expecting green to um, slowly uh, increase over time, right? Um, so by the way, just like my view on like, is it, are, are we in a state that's good enough or not? Is that uh, one of the nice things about blocks be a uh, transaction censorship in blocks is that it's what I call a one event trust model, right? So even if, you know, you have 99% of uh, 
builders uh, or block proposers connecting to builders that are censoring. That just means that someone has to wait a hundred uh, blo uh, blocks instead of one, and that's still like kind of fine for them, right? Like basically, if you like, if you want stuff to be censored, you'd have to like reach pretty much everyone. But at the same time, we had. Or you'd have to lean on pretty much everyone and get them to stop including um, uncensored uh, blocks. But at the same time, like, you know, given how things like, you know, norm cascades work and just all of their social phenomena, like, we're definitely not head in the sand about this, right? So, like, just to, to give some con concrete examples of uh, the uh, Ethereum ecosystem being not head in the sand, um, one is that um, a co multiple new um, entities announced um, in... I think is in December, in January, that they have started uh, operating non-censoring uh, non yeah. relays, uh, right? And uh, yeah, and like a lot of them are even, you know, entities that are, you know, outside the U.S. serving stakers that are outside the U.S. and all, the, uh, and all that. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they did launch and uh, some people have uh, switched over to them, um, but it's... Uh, it's like one of those slow processes because I um, mean, you know, staking is like a multi-billion dollar thing, and everyone who participates wants to be yeah, ca just careful about moving over infrastructure and all that. So that was the first thing. The second thing is that fl the Flashbots team added a uh, setting to MEV Boost that allows you to say, "I'm only outsourcing block production in those cases when outsourcing the block production is significantly profitable." Right, so. If the revenue is like less than 0.05 or some threshold, then you can still make blocks yourself. If it's over 0.05, then you can, uh, you know, go and outsource. And it turns out that if everyone set 0.05 as their fee setting, then you would have a world where 40% of blocks would not be outsourced, but every yeah, single validator would gain like something like 96% of the revenue gains that they would gain from outsourcing all of the time. Right. So this is like one of the examples of what I mean when I say that people are outsourcing too much. Um, and that's a setting that people are starting to use. And then in the longer term, I think one thing that we want to do is this concept of uh, partial block auctions where um, it basically, yeah, instead of uh, it's like when you outsource, you set conditions. So you say, for example, I have seen these 20, these 23 transactions. And so when you create a block, I want you to include all right. 23 of these transactions. Um, or I'm going to let you choose the first five transactions in the block, but I'm going to choose the other ones. And if you do this, then like you're still going to be able to get like 99% of the revenue from full outsourcing. But because 99% of the revenue from full outsourcing really comes in like the first five or 10 transactions. But at the same time, um, you know, like if everyone does that, then like from a censorship perspective, that's the chain is going to be fine, right? So that's the ba that's the base chain. Um, I think uh, uh, the other thing that I I think is worth talking about is like the application layer perspective on privacy, which I think is important. Like privacy is super important, but I th I do think that there's like there definitely are these kind of extra legal challenges that have to be in a, a that have to be navigated, right? Like basically, yeah. So, you know, Tornado Cash exists and Tornado Cash still exists, right? But like, even if Tornado Cash is, um, is still completely, yeah, you know, usable and, uns and uncensored from an Ethereum protocol perspective, that does still in practice, like, like, the legal actions have in practice limited its usefulness, right? And they've limited its usefulness for two reasons. One of those reasons is that it's uh, you know, become extremely legally risky to use for uh, US persons. But the other reason is that if you receive a Tornado Cash coin, you're going to get a lot more trouble from like exchanges and the entire rest of the kind of crypto fiat bridge ecosystem that needs to comply, right? Like one approach to trying to kind of uh, uh, deal with that is to basically say, you know, we're going to make privacy a default for everyone and uh, we're just going to make it, uh, you know, impossible for anyone to distinguish themselves from, uh, from uh, anyone else and also try really so hard. So that's actually but, where I was going to um, okay, go is basically yeah. that, and maybe we can do this and then we'll move on to other stuff besides mm -hmm. crypto stuff. But it seems to me like something where, um, you know, whether it's commit reveal or zero knowledge commit, there's like a bunch of different dynamics, but where miners can't see what transactions they're including, nobody can see what transactions they're including. It takes away MEV. Mm -hmm. That's a justification for it on a completely different grounds. And 
you have privacy baked in at the base layer where you intentionally make miners dumb pipes in a sense, right? They're blinded to it. And there's probably some clever crypto, you know, cryptographic tricks you could pull to make that feasible. And then you also support zero knowledge for the transactions themselves, not just the, you know, the mining process. And so something like that where the system cannot, quote, discriminate against transactions because it cannot tell the difference between them seems like where you ultimately want to go or, you know, tell me, tell me your thoughts on that. Yeah. I mean, I think at protocol level, um, moving in that direction, it would, would definitely be yeah, really interesting, but maybe you but, could do it on an L2. Yeah. But, but I mean, like at application level, I think it's more challenging. Right. And at application level, I think the, yeah, like, I, I mean, I know this is a, a very yeah, controversial topic and, uh, you know, people have, uh, um, you know, all kinds of uh, opinions on this. And I think, uh, like, my view on this is probably uh, a, a little bit more willing to compromise than uh, some of the purists, which is that, like, even though, like, I think that the uh, Ethereum chain should, like, ex should absolutely have, like, layer one censorship resistance as the hill it dies on. And, uh, you know, if it has a choice between, um, you know, censoring on L1 and, uh, you know, even like a a fifty percent chance of uh, getting killed. Uh, like it should even take a fifty percent the take the fifty percent chance of getting killed because once creative uh, once credible neutrality is of the chain is broken, then what's the point? But on the application layer, like like first of all, you know, I think uh, you know there there are legitimate concerns, right? So like you know, it is true that a very large portion of the uh, inputs to Tornado Cash ended up being these large scale DeFi hackers. You know, it is true that there are a lot of uh, large scale criminals who are using these uh, using these systems and who would uh, use these kinds of systems if they uh, ended up uh, you know even be kind of becoming much much larger on chain. Of which one of the largest um, criminals is. Maybe supposedly the North Korean government. So, would you say government was one of the largest criminals? Anyway, just go. Yes, <laughs> keep going. Yeah. I mean, very possible, you know. Um, but it's, uh, and I think just also from a philosophical perspective, right? Like, like if I had to choose, um, you know, what would the right uh, kind of place to be in terms of financial privacy? Like, there's this, uh, so there's this slogan that you know, even I think a lot the the cypherpunks originated like twenty or thirty years ago, which is uh, like. What we want is transparency for the powerful and privacy for the weak, right? Yeah, like surveillance, but from below, yes. right? Mm, exactly. And I think like even outside of uh, law enforcement use cases, like, you know, people appreciate the fact that they yeah, can do kind of open source on-chain analytics and like track the crazy billion dollar stuff that's been happening inside of FTX or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, what uh, some of the other large exchanges are yep. doing or whatever, right? So I think... Uh, what would be yeah, what would be nice, uh, you know, is a world where there was something approaching complete anonymity for small transactions and um, you know very high privacy for medium transactions, but where larger transactions and especially transactions that um, you know huge amounts of uh, people don't like, don't even you know want to mix uh, to, to mix themselves in with um, you know, don't necessarily have that same level of privacy. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing, right. And the interesting thing about zero knowledge cryptography is that it actually lets us do this, right? So here's like the simple um, way to do this. Um, so imagine a version of Tornado Cash where when you withdraw from Tornado Cash, you make one proof, which is uh, proving that, you know, you have a valid coin that's deposited into the system and you haven't done, you, and you haven't withdrawn yet, which is the thing that's being proven now. But you also add in another proof which proves that you are not one of, um, let's say, 23 addresses that like Chainalysis or some collection of, or, of organizations uh, decided, you know, are large scale, possibly North Korean hackers, right? So like you as a user decide to say, hey, I'm willing to mix myself in with the randos, but I'm not willing to mix myself <laughs> in with large scale DeFi hackers and contribute to large scale DeFi hackers anonymity sets, right? And if let's say, yeah, 95% of users take this option, uh, then the anonymity set of the large scale DeFi hacker reduces by a factor of 20, right? Um, and so that makes like privacy for large scale DeFi hackers much smaller without affecting privacy for everyone else. And like the, the really nice thing about it is that it's incentive compatible, right? Because 
like you as a user, you know, you want to, I think, uh, prove that you're not a large scale DeFi hacker, both because, um, you know, you as a user, you know, I think morally don't want to support that kind of behavior. And because you as a user don't want to get this mistaken for a possible DeFi hacker and, uh, you know, get a higher suspicion score or whatever because of this, right? Have you ever seen the ending of the Thomas Crown Affair? It's the, uh, it's the scene where they all are wearing hats and they're indistinguishable from each other. And I think what I just, uh, you know, uh, Zuko has talked about this as well, but it's not a private transaction. It's a privacy set, right? The, that pool in which you can. So I think, uh, you know, your comment there just made me realize that um, privacy is actually a collective good that a group can choose to give a member or not. It's not that say it's not just a technical thing it is that because obviously there's cryptographic kinds of privacy where you can't invert a function you know determine who wrote something like you know let's say you hash a document you can't just invert that it doesn't matter how many people are around it but a but a collective privacy does exist as well for some use cases and thinking about that as a tool that you can dial up or dial down based on consent is interesting just a, just an interesting point um I, I had known about it in the context of zcash i just hadn't thought about it in the context of something that the members could selectively do. Actually, you know, in ring signatures, that's more common where people are choosing who's part of the ring, right? But I just hadn't seen it in just this particular context, which is interesting. So do you want to switch gears for a second? We've talked about crypto for about an hour. We'll spend one more hour on other stuff. All right. So second big question. First big question was basically what's going on with Ethereum? What should we know about the history? What should we know about, you know, wh what happened with the merge and with the, all the stuff in 2016? And, you know, uh, how does Ethereum actually become a final product? How do you get past, uh, uh, you know, the issues with uh, um, OFAC compliant miners? And how do we increase freedom there? How do we get past uh, the withdrawal issue? There's a pull request or, you know, there's, there's going to be a hard fork on that early or next year. And then how do we add more privacy? We talked about all that stuff. Okay, so now switching gears. Um, here's a big question. Ready? All right. So Vitalik, you have, uh, you know, as I've said many times, we've started new companies, we started new communities and you yourself have started a very important new currency. So if you could go one more level, what new country would you start and why? Hmm. So I think it's, uh, important to approach that question not from the yeah, the kind of LARPy point of view of sure. like I want to have a country right. because countries are cool right it's uh, like this like it's actually important I think to kind of dig down into um, you know what is a country break it into its constituent parts and like which of those constituent parts do you need do do we need and particularly you know which of those parts in what combination are valuable for people in the context of um, you know, being uh, just out of uh, the uh, grand old year of 2022, yep. right? Um, I so mean, I, the serious version is, what is the single biggest problem in the world that you'd address with that new country? Or would you, for example, disagree that there'd be a single biggest problem as per our discussion the other day? Maybe you can go into that. Mm -hmm. Right. So... I think uh, one of the ways to kind of break down a country, right, is that there is the social network and there are the uh, legal and jurisdictional properties, right? And I mean, possibly a third one is like physical location properties, right? So like, for example, if, you know, even if, um, you know, you uh, decide that the uh, legal envir um, environment and even cultural environment of um, like, you know, Dubai, for example, is uh, is perfect for you. And like, I mean, which like I personally, you know, don't think I mean, I think there's uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, you know, upsides, definitely, but also a lot of downsides uh, there there, too. Right. But like the. The really big one is climate, right? And climate is not their fault, and uh, climate is uh, not uh, is kind of something that definitely has been, um, you know, unfairly allocated in a lot of uh, in a lot of ways. And you know, there's a, a strong case that uh, climate is kind of being unfairly reallocated with uh, you know global warming and the uh, emissions that are um, that are happening, and how that's uh, kind of maybe good for Canada and Russia and Norway, but, uh, you know, not very good for a huge number of other people. 
But climate's like the third one, right? So one is uh, social network, two is jurisdictional properties, and uh, three is uh, climate. And the lives, the laws of the land. That, right, exactly. It's funny because, you know, one thing when I talk about this with people, I think most people go immediately to uh, how do you get the land or, okay, we need to write up a constitution, write up laws. And I think that the, the people is actually the most important part because, you know, laws are boundary conditions, you know, in the sense of you're, they're, uh, the things that are mandatory or forbidden. They're, they're the edge cases typically. You don't usually run into a law in your daily basis, you know, like as you're, as you're running around. And, and the land also, you know, uh, it's hard to get land and you might just start with the community and then you can afford land rather than vice versa. So I'd always be in, you know, and that's a big, premise of the network tip. I think those are two, I, I don't quite call them false doors, um, but they're traditional ways that people have started things or thought about things that are perhaps a little less applicable today. The counter argument would be something like code is very similar to law, but you're writing code all the time. And I think the difference is um, the machine doesn't do anything unless the code is telling it to do something, but the human does something unless the law tells it not to do something. And that's like, I think a difference in terms of code versus law, that's a difference between code. I know I like less than code as law, but that is one difference between code and law. Anyway, go ahead. You're, you're saying, so all those are things climate you thought was, or land was a big thing. So for those folks who have bad land, you would do X. What is X? I think uh, one way to um, look at it, one way to kind of separate out like um, to what extent, you, like what properties you need of jurisdiction is to think about the difference between starting a new country and starting a new city, right? So a city is also a social network and cities are also very climate dependent, right? Um, so I uh, yeah, don't know if you've uh, seen the, uh, ch the, the, the charts and maps, but like there's this... Uh, Really annoying fact about the U.S., and uh, this is uh, one of the uh, reasons why so, uh, so many people end up moving to California, is that California is like literally the only place in the mainland U.S. that has what uh, a lot of people would call a pleasant climate, right? So if you look at like number of hours of sunshine, California scores remarkably well. If you look at there is a statistic number of pleasant days, like someone actually tried going through this, they defined a pleasant day as like a day where the temperature doesn't go out somewhere outside of like, I think it's eight to 24 degrees. And the average might be like between 12 and 20 or something like that. And there's no rain or uh, there's no rain and there's no snow on the ground. Like California just like beats out um, all the other parts of the mainland US. Um, there, like there is a huge tax to being in California, right? Like there's, uh, I mean, first of all, um, you know, regulatory issues and kind of, you know, the the whole famous thing where like pretty much uh, everything that's uh, based there needs to have, um, you know, some kind of a, a warning label saying that it's, uh, you know, may contain traces of something that may, that, that may contain traces of causing cancer or whatever. Um, but then there, the other one that I think is a much bigger for a lot of people also lives is the cost, right? And Cost is, uh, um, California is expensive. Um, real estate in California is expensive. And there even is this kind of pathological effect where, you know, the, co the combination of building restrictions and property right, uh, rights uh, rules and like a whole, a whole bunch of aspects of law basically mean that like there is this, uh, you know, funnel where huge amounts of uh, like the, yes, basically the, the, the Silicon Valley startup ecosystem essentially gets uh, really yeah, heavily yeah, and, you know, de facto kind of taxed and, and kind of blood sucked by California landowners. A lot of it's deadweight loss also, though, because landlords would prefer to actually just build more. So it's like laws that are just causing them to jack up prices because they can't build more units. They'd prefer to do it on volume, any of them. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, you're saying. Exactly, right. But despite this, uh, you know, very heavy... Yeah, drag on the yeah, doing things in California, there's like, it's still a huge network effect, right? And, uh, you know, we've just been seeing how much of an uphill battle it is to, uh, for, for projects to, you know, real, uh, relocate to other places. I'm actually, I think uh, crypto, interestingly enough, has uh, been 
possibly the one frontier tech industry of the last decade that has managed to really be really in, uh, not be California centric, right? I mean, maybe there is a couple of others, like maybe, uh, you know, bio is uh, some California and some Boston. And, but I feel like crypto is like scores, crypto has scored better on decentralization than a lot of the others. Uh, but like AI, very Bay Area focused, um, you know, VR, from what I can tell, seems pretty Bay Area focused. Um, you know, Meta is there. Um, Apple is in Cupertino. You know, Google's there. Google's there. Um, like, it is a huge attractor. And part of that is just network effects and uh, a, a strong initial network effect leading to even more network effects. But part of that is just like the climate being closets, right? Uh, so... Well, but coming back up, so, so, so then how would you relate that to... So to if you're starting a new country, you are... Addressing climate, how? Right. If you're starting a new country or a new city, right. So this is where we have to kind of unpack things, right? Like one is uh, that like climate is just an important property, right? So uh, uh, of, uh, you know, w whatever kind of in-person physical thing that you want to start. And basically, if you're starting a new X, then the thing that you have to create from scratch is a network effect, right? Like you're basically paying a large network effects penalty from the beginning. And there are people who I think are willing to pay the network effects penalty because they want a different kind of network effects. They're willing to sacrifice quali uh, quantity of network to get quality of network, right? But ne that network effect is uh, one thing that's being like sacrificed or at least kind of radically reimagined out the door. Um, as far as like what the climate needs are, that's, a, that's one of the two factors that's going to judge where you want to base yourself. and. Uh, you know, do you want to be uh, in an existing country? Do you want to, um, you know, be in a big country? Do you want to be in a small country? Do you want to be in a particular part of the world? Um, I think um, other things that I would add to climate, uh, because like, even though they're not technically climate, but they're still kind of features that are given to us by the physical world, time zones are a big one, right? So uh, if you want to like remote work uh, for American companies, it's much easier to be in Argentina than it is to be in uh, Europe, despite those two being equal distances from America, because, uh, you know, in Argentina you have, and in Latin America in general, you have uh, time zone compatibility, right? So there's a lot of those uh, deciding factors that come from the natural environment. And then there are also these uh, deciding factors that come from the law, right? And so basically the question is like, what what is the benefit that you're trying to achieve and what are the things that you're willing to sacrifice a lot of people don't really have that much fancy stuff that they want to that that they need to do in terms of uh, in terms of law for example right like for a lot of uh you know people in projects actually uh, the big law that that people don't sometimes don't realize that is a law, but that they uh, wants to uh, that they want to escape is a U.S. immigration law, right? Like the U.S. and a lot of other wealthy countries, they do have um, you know quite restrictive um, immigration in a lot of ways, and like the the tragedy is that sometimes it's pathologically restrictive in that. Like people who, you know, try to go in the front door can, uh, and, you know, apply for visas and all that. Like in India, I think it takes like, what, 900 days to get an appointment or something uh, crazy like that. But on the other hand, um, you know, if you're willing to take the, uh, the route of, um, you know, jumping fences a bunch of times, then yep. like sometimes that's even easier than, uh, you know, taking it, the it uh, is quote unquote. Anarcho tyrannical in the sense of like the law isn't enforced on the law abiding. Or the, the law is enforced, but only on the law abiding and is not mm -hmm. enforced on, you know, uh, it right. seems how logical that's not. It's like those who are habitually law abiding or have, have the book thrown at them for small immigration things. Yeah, but, but like U.S. immigration law, like is uh, like it really is a huge drag on, I think, like a lot of different. It's uh, also not letting in and, uh, high end talent. It's, 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 it's basically just deadweight loss across the whole system. It's not it's not smart. Yeah. Right. And it's one of like it's one of those things that's like potentially a uh, like a 2x or 3x tax on many uh, groups of people's ability to operate even if they're doing some completely normal right. thing that Right. And the thing is it's it's one of those things where basically right. different groups it's not simply about making immigration law harsher as some people think it is because what happens is that is just those laws are just enforced against those people who are who are not the folks that are, um, it's not like the guy who came across and, and shot somebody, you know, it's a person who's filling out, you know, paperwork to be a programmer. 
But anyway, we, so we kind of got off track a little bit here. So climate and cost. I mean, the one thing about climate, just for a second, or land, is um, I would argue potentially, at least for a new country, the more desirable the land, the less desirable the land. And the reason I say that is the more desirable the land, the more contentious it is for people to try and get it. Whereas if it's something that's godforsaken middle of nowhere, like what Burning Man was built on, it's easier to build on it if your goal is freedom as opposed to a pleasant climate. Mm -hmm. Pleasant climate, I think, is like mm -hmm. the very hardest thing to right. get because it's so broadly appreciated and so mimetic in a sense. Mm -hmm. So you might have to suffer a bit, you know, land-wise in order to, mm -hmm. you know, get freedom. Yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's very possible. Um, I think, uh, but I think the bigger lesson from all of this, right, is that there are ways to um, improve your situation in terms of law, right? So, like for example, there are lots of countries that are visa free uh, uh, to uh, Chinese people. There's uh, an unfortunately smaller number, but definitely still. Uh, significant number of countries that are even visa free to india people i mean india itself is visa free to india people <laughs> obviously uh but uh, at the and then there are countries that um are just easier to get visas for right like there's uh, you know countries that have visa regimes but uh, you know they're not indians are not going to have to wait 900 days to get one but at the same time like if you have to be willing to sacrifice something right like the hard thing in the world is to find kind of like actual alpha, like to find, to actually find something which is like further along the frontier, along all the dimensions that people care about. Is pretty optimal of some kind. You're trading off A for B. Exactly. The, the, the easier thing to do is to try to, is to get a better score on dimensions that you care more about by sacrificing something on dimensions that you care less about, either because you have like you're you just are the kind of person or you're more or or you have some trick for like tolerating a um, lower quality on those dimensions or because you have like some different path for getting those same things right and i think the big thing like one of the ways to think about the like network the start a new city or start a new country genre is that it's basically the genre of saying well what are the things that you can get if you're willing to completely sacrifice on network effects hmm. because yep. you're going to bring your own network effect, right? If you can bring your own, like there's a lot of, uh, you get a lot of options, right? Uh, so for example, um, over the last year and a quarter, one of the things that I did is I um, intentionally uh, spent more time than I usually do in like very small towns, right? Tell, tell everybody about it because uh, most people don't know about it. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Svalbard is uh, an island a thousand kilometers uh, north of Norway. It is uh, officially uh, part of Norway, but there are international treaties that have existed for about a hundred years that say that anyone from the world is uh, legally allowed to come and live there. Open Borders Act, but it's so forbidding that many people don't actually exercise that right. Exactly. So the yeah, largest city in Svalbard is a town called Longyearbyen. It has a population of about 3,000. Its latitude is 78 degrees north. But interestingly enough, the climate is a, a somewhat less inhospitable than it seems, right? Because uh, basically that entire region, like all of uh, Scandinavia, benefits hugely from the Gulf Stream. And, and the Gulf Stream makes uh, all of those regions significantly warmer than like lots of stuff at comparable latitude. If you look at, say, Tromso, a city in Norway, 69 degrees latitude, the lowest temperatures there are like actually not much worse than the lowest temperatures in Toronto, which has 45 degrees latitude. Um, but the latitude there is much higher than Svalbard. Like when I was uh, there in September, the temperature is like between minus five and plus five. So like actually... Uh, you know, New Yorkers can totally adapt to it. Minus five and plus five, I guess that's adapt. At least it's 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 not like too bad, right? I mean, it does get it definitely does get bad in uh, Jan like in January, for example, right? But uh, so you know, there is a reason it hasn't grown to more than three thousand people. But it's like it's less bad than a lot of people think, right? And there is a town of three thousand people, and that town has a large supermarket. And has a post office. It has a hospital. It has an airport, and it has one of the best sushi restaurants I've been to in a while. Okay, now it's going to have lots and lots of people <laughs> going and visiting there. We're going to have a hundred thousand people, <laughs> right? I mean, I think like I think marginally it'll benefit Some more from tourists, uh, getting more people coming there, right? But it's uh, 
definitely, you know, encourage people to just like go and visit. And, you know, if they can visit for a longer time, like, you know, given up to two weeks or so just to get a feel for like, you know, what it feels like to actually live in this kind of place. Um, but it's interesting how even in a town of 3000 people, like that kind of infrastructure you can get, right? Like you have a supermarket, you have a hospital, you have sushi. Um, if you do the math, then uh, 3000 people basically means that you have about 30 people per a uh, year level, which means that, uh, so Long Yerbian also has a school, right? And at 30 people, that's enough for like one or two classes per grade. Uh, so it's, uh, actually surprising, like, how few people need to, to get civilization. Like, at le- enough network effects to at least have the bo- to at least have the boring basics, right? But the one thing that you can't get with three thousand people is you can't get like people that are organized around particular interests, right? Whether that's for like work or whether that's for like for for you know just like social interaction reasons, right? And- I've often thought about how the early American colonies is only about two and a half million people at the time of independence, something like that. You know, the Greeks. Very small population at the time. I think Rome was only like a million people yeah. or something. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, these are much mm-hmm. smaller than we think of. Uh, and not, not Rome, the entire empire, but I think the city of Rome mm-hmm. in the Roman Empire was like a million people at, at, at that time. Mm-hmm. I might be wrong about that. We'll check that in the mm-hmm. show notes. Yeah, but like, was fa- like the thing that's fascinating, right, is that 3,000 people is like actually, yeah, it's totally viable from that standpoint. Like I think uh, as a yeah, re- resident of 3,000 person town, your main risk is getting bored, right? And I mean, also you have a risk of, um, you know, not having, not being able to find a good job. And one way to answer that is to basically say, we're only going to cater to remote workers and uh, remote work is only going to grow from here. Another way to answer that is basically through the same channel that um, w- we can answer the being bored problem, which is, well, let's look at the one type of town that already exists that has a small population that is still very interesting for people to often spend um, large amounts of time in, and that's the university town, right? So, you know, you have something like Ithaca in in upstate New York, population 30,000, home of Cornell. And, uh, you know, if you uh, care about any of the uh, academic topics uh, that Cornell specializes in, then like, you know, you're you're not going to be bored, right? And uh, so if you like really concentrate and you really try to create a network effect around specific kinds of people, then you don't, you don't even need 30,000, like even 3000 is going to be enough, right? Like if uh, half of those 3000 are people who are into, let's say crypto or let's say longevity research, you can create an environment that's like gives people enough of that, that it with a uh, surprisingly small, uh, a small size, right? Um, so then, you know, what do you get for that, right? One of the things that you get is, uh, I think, uh, cost savings, right? Another thing that you get is uh, like the right type of network effect, right? So you, or a different type of network effect, you sacrifice on uh, quality and, uh, or you sacrifice on quantity and you get quality. Um, cost savings are also huge, right? Like uh, one of the big things that I think has happened over the last 10 years is that Prices have increased in the U.S. significantly more than they have increased in a lot of other countries. We were talking about this. I, I mean, like do that. we have a graph of that? I'd love to. I, I think that's true, but I'd love to see that. I, I, I agree, but go ahead. You know, I, I, yeah, that's actually something that I haven't checked yet, right? But like, it just like it feels right. true from my from my personal experience. In even uh, Switzerland, I think uh, the price of like tea in Starbucks has increased very little little or like maybe even not at all over the last um, over the last 10 years which uh, I thought was fascinating right so costs are huge and uh, the cost difference between being in the US and being in basically any other country is like getting to be pretty significant at this point well I think to be fair it's always been significant but I think what we're seeing now is like it's qualitative difference at the same time the uh, and, and you uh, can earn outside right but it's like at the same time you see Right. A significant, right. One thing is that a significant cost difference is staying. Another thing is that now you can earn outside and more generally, like the quality of life difference between being in a major center and, uh, and being in, you know, what gets called a kind of quote periphery location. The costs have increased as the benefits have decreased. And so they're coming closer together. Yeah. Go ahead. Exactly. Right. So that creates a big opportunity, right? So cost is one. Um, and then, you know, you've mentioned the law is another one and, uh, Law is an interesting one because um, I think it's uh, it's one that a lot of people don't think about it. And 
it's easier to not think about if you're in a situation that fe- that is kind of like that feels to you as being normal, right? Because uh, if you're just an average American and uh, you know you're you're doing some completely yeah, you know norby industry, that's uh, you're not pro- going to feel um, you know law as like as being a large drag. And and it's and it's even easy for you to get into the mindset of believing that oh it like if someone does come up to them and tell them the law is a big drag, well possibly yeah, yeah. they're doing something right. wrong and they have something to hide, right? And what's uh, interesting is like the further away you get from like that kind of pr- like privileged rich country context, the and like I think it's even important to kind of you know, to uh, talk about the rich country part, right? Because uh, like even the yeah, privilege uh, discourse that exists within rich countries, it tends to, fo- like at least in my view, it focuses a lot on underprivileged right. people within those rich countries. But you know, there's also this entire ma- like much larger mass of people around the world around the world that are not even in those uh, rich countries, right? And I think even the U.S. and even progressives in the U.S. often still have, uh, you know, what's de facto very much an out, out of sight, out of mind uh, mentality toward the, a, a lot of those people. Um, but uh, the further away you get from, um, you know, being in in a, uh, a a citizen of a rich country, the uh, further away you get from being in a kind of average industry, the more you start feeling these kinds of things, right? So obviously the crypto space, I think, has... Uh, felt regulatory pressures uh, very keenly from the uh, from the beginning but in 2022 i think uh, caring about the law like really universalized in a lot of ways right in the sense that like there were a lot of uh, countries like a lot of non-us countries and even uh, you know anti-western countries that have uh, historically been authoritarian but the Politic- geopolitical environment for the last uh, 20 years has been this kind of fairly stable one and fairly friendly one where even in the authoritarian ones, the authoritarianism kind of felt theoretical. And it's like, oh, you know, if you personally aren't somebody who like really cares about criticizing the government and like, why would you even do that when I'll just focus on your family, um, then you're not really feeling much, right? You know, hey, yeah, you know, focus on the family, you know, enjoy the, yeah, enjoy the local culture, enjoy the trains. And, you know, and it, it doesn't look that bad in the normal case from like that kind of a, co- a cultural standpoint. But like in 2022, in a whole bunch of ways, the authoritarianism became real, right? And it became something that even really heavily touched the yeah, lives of normal people. And it's something that just overnight created a whole bunch of like basically homeless nomads, right? Like I personally have multiple friends who in 2022 just like packed up, left their country, and they're just jumping yep. around and so they're not really clear where they live. Um, and these... In a lot of those cases, these are even people who were not that worried about the you know, political environments of uh, where they came from before 2022 hit, it's, right? So on the one hand, you it's have costs. Like I have, yeah. I have a visual analogy that you may or may not agree with. This is like, a, you know, for example, when you're driving on the highway, your speed limit could be minimum 40 miles, maximum 55 miles per hour. And that's like a, you know, it's a bounding box that you have to be within. Your V has to be within that, right? And you start extending that to every other set of laws and essentially regulations in the law are a bounding box where you have to remain within that, right? Speed greater than this, you know, not less than this. Your, you know, bank account balance uh, at a certain time can't be over this or under this or, I mean, that's everyone. Um, I don't know, for example, building cannot be more than this high. It probably cannot be more than this low, that kind of stuff, right? Multiply that across thousands, hundreds of thousands of laws, all the laws. So you have to sit within this box. And most of the time, most of your environment, most of your life is configured to live within that box. So you're so in the box that you don't even feel the edges. But then sometimes, like in 2022 or really recently, those edges suddenly like move and they kind of put you outside of that box where what was totally normal suddenly becomes abnormal. And you're, you know, looking around, you're like, how did that happen? I thought I was just totally in the mainstream. And then this just sliding of walls got you outside the mainstream. And I think that in many ways, what we're, we do in crypto is for the powerless and the power user in different ways, they're pushing the limits like the powerless 
wants to hold on to a bank account and the power user is pushing the limits of what a bank account can even do. And sometimes they're the same person or the same entity, like, hmm. like Binance is both absolutely a power user of money, but I'm sure early on, maybe now, but you know, they had like, it's, let's call it regulatory issues or what have you, right? Like they, you know, well, well reported. Um, I, you know, I have no beef with Binance whatsoever. I'm just saying sometimes it's the same person at the same time. Those are not necessarily disjoint categories. And so that reminds me of what you're saying, which is um, these walls on this box that people took for being static became dynamic. These constants became variables. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Like some, like I think uh, up until 2000 uh, that, and uh, 22, you just like, had to be either one of those people whose situation was that you were in a beside a wall or in a cor or in a corner of the room, or you just had to be an explorer that would uh, frequently touch against them. But like, yes, in twenty twenty two, the walls moved. Yes, and, exactly. Uh, and so, big. so I'm bringing that back to the start a new country thing, right? So, if you could start a new country, how would you? So, you know, we talked about the climate aspect and so on. We talked about cost. So, and now we're talking about law. So, it seems like what you try to do is hyper deflate cost or, you know, obviously I know I'm poking on this thing cause I've thought about this a lot and, you know, um, but you know, what is, would you, would it be Ethereum based? I assume either Landia, right. Um, is there, is there some funny, uh, Ethereum? I don't know. What would be the, what would be the land if the dollar is a currency? Well, it, it doesn't actually conjugate in quite that way, right? Hmm. You might have Germany and the Germans, mm -hmm. but the mark doesn't quite conjugate. So, Let's say you've got Ethereum. What does the Ethereum land look like? Right. And and is that related to this? Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a, well, right. It's a good question. I mean, I think uh, what, one of the questions is like, what actually makes sense to create as a new land? And the other question is, uh, what level of tie it should have to Ethereum, right? Because uh, I think on the second question, like one of the things that I do wants to be uh, careful about is like not assuming, um, you know, more agreement between people than actually exists and uh you know not basically like I, I want to avoid getting into the like intersectional activism trap where you know you start by creating a community around one cause and then um, you know you start kind of like adding on more and more of these uh, coalition partners that have their own causes that uh, you know they're they're good at expressing in your language but then a lot of the time when you poke into the details you just uh, end up getting stuck in a mindset where like the uh, the you know the intersection of all the causes actually only appeals they're to like against, one to you, five percent. People are who are against what you're against, but they're not for what you're for. That's the tricky part where you'll win the war, but you won't win the peace. Go ahead. Right. That's exactly right. So yeah, to what extent like some, uh, you know, new city or new country started by Ethereum people like should even uh, market itself as being part um a part of the Ethereum verse or even being a central part of the Ethereum verse, right? Like those two are different. Like, like to what extent, uh, like, like, I think it would be, it might even be good to be careful about creating the uh, impression that if you're an Ethereum person, mm. you have to like this other thing. Like, I think it's, it's big uh, enough now. Even, it's millions of people using it. So exactly. Like, I think there's even, um, you know, virtue in, uh, kind of, uh, you know, people who are in uh, multiple movements, like basically, yeah, say like saying that it's okay to be with me on one thing, but not, uh, but not the other thing. On the second question, right? I think the yeah, the answer is maybe anything, but at the same time, I like I do think that uh, there's a huge moment, uh, momentum within the Ethereum ecosystem for um, wanting this kind of thing, and so I think uh, like. The crypto world and uh, the uh, and the Ethereum world are definitely like natural places to start, and I think are just uh, inevitably going to be big parts of uh, you know any new country that's or or any new city that uh, gets created, right? Um, so it's it's you know there's about three hundred million, depending on how you count it, but like Coinbase and Binance alone are a good chunk of it. At least three hundred million crypto users worldwide who hold at least some cryptocurrency, and I kind of do think of them as an intuit country because you know they they all need to kind of accept each other's coin right and so they have to have in a sense a bilateral relationship where it started kind of currency and network first so it is a good group of people early adopters somewhat risk tolerant that could pioneer something like this even if they aren't all pure 100 percent ethereum or what have you they would likely certainly know about it and hold some um so that's so why i think it's a, not a bad analogy or at least a, a, it's a it's a it's a predicate for it. It's not, it's not the full thing. 
Right. I mean, I think uh, one good analogy for this might be like, so if you take like Farcaster, for mm. example, right? So this actually gets to another um, topic that I think is um, important, which is uh, that one thing that I think network states and social networks have in common is that especially like to, just to be able to get them started, it's not about the institutions. It's not about yep. the technology. It's about the people. Right. Like if if you imagine five clones of Farcaster where, let's say, one of them is run by Dan Romero, um, another of them is run by, let's say, a uh, an American trans social justice activist. A third is run by, uh, let's say, an Indian person. A uh, fourth is uh, run by, let's say, uh, some... Eastern European ultra nationalist, and uh, who, by the way, um, likes Bitcoin and thinks that Bitcoin is the only coin. Um, and a fifth is uh, run by like some fourteen year old um, in uh, in Hangzhou that uh, just uh, you know happens to be uh, interested in in let's say, you know, like West African philosophy and has some, you know, really crazy yeah, a, a fusion ideology that for whatever reason they can convince that uh, he can convince a significant fraction of uh, Chinese people to, or Chinese Generation Z or Generation A to adopt, but no one else, right? Like those five forecasters are going to look very different. I have I have a concrete a concrete example for you. Uh, do you know what share chat is? It is that third example. It's an Indian social network that is non-English. And so there's a Hindi channel, a Bengali channel, a Malayalam channel, a Kannada channel, and so on, right? Tamil channel. And um, so that's an example of something which is Twitter-like, but looks very different than actually, because Farcaster has Ethereum functionality built into it. So therefore it's like Ethereum Twitter. This has, it's it's just partition of different axes. You wouldn't have thought of, okay, which Indian language do you speak as being a primary axis for Farcaster? But it is for this, right? Whereas Farcrash is like, which NFTs do you hold? So it's just like moving on a different axis. Go ahead. Yeah, right. But I think the, the larger point, right, is that like the, the root community is important. And uh, I think this was a yeah, lesson that I, uh, I think I kind of intuited for Ethereum itself, right? That uh, like the different, one of the differences between like Web 2 and uh, Web 3, I think, is that like things like Facebook, they just try to scale to the world and reach out to everyone, right? And uh, things in the crypto space and things in the network state space and things in uh, even, let's say, the radical democracy space, like they're, they are more rooted in specific communities and they do, they are, I think, kind of more respectful of the idea that like, well, sometimes network effects aren't positive, network effects are negative, right? There are people who are negative value to other participants, especially when you create like products or ecosystems where the yeah, interaction between the participants is Yes, uh, like, I think, complex, I mean, it is, it's like, right? you know, saying like law is meant for virtuous people. And, you know, like I'm paraphrasing, but that's like the early... The you know founding fathers said you know we can write all this stuff down but it's meant to deal with things in the breach you have to basically be good you know or like you have to be virtuous so it's kind of like that you, the the structure is something that expresses the community's will okay so basically we've got about you know fifteen ish ten minutes left um, and uh, so just to recap what did we talk about well we talked about a brief history of Ethereum from concept to the present day. We covered the merge and the DAO hack and OFAC and privacy and a bunch of other things. We talked about, um, you know, what new country you'd start and addressing problems like climate and cost and whether Ethereum people would be there. You talked about actually the really interesting place, Svalbard, that anybody can go to and how what open borders would actually look like in real life. We have we have an empirical example of it. Should be on the cover of a bunch of books. Uh, maybe it'll it'll be changed by that attention. And uh, I wanted to maybe touch on one last thing, which is, um, you know, we've talked about how to improve the world. We've talked about how to improve Ethereum. How can people improve themselves? What should they read, watch, and listen? What online courses? What should they be doing? You know, like how? how what would you advise people to do to to level up? Sure. Um, so I think uh, one of the reasons why this uh, is an interesting topic is that it's not even entirely separate from the uh, network uh, state topic, right? Because uh, to a very surprising extent, I think like learning and motivation are very social, right? 
And they, like being really successful in those things actually depends on having the right social environment. And I think this is one of the key reasons why, like, for example, um, you know, Coursera and the various MOOCs have uh, failed to completely replace uh, Stanford uh, to the uh, in, in anything like the extent that a lot of uh, people were predicting. Like, I mean, one aspect is definitely uh, you know, just like credentialism and the fact that the MOOCs don't give you a fancy diploma. But I think the uh, like the social element to learning and motivation is the other a really big one and actually it's a, like the, the question of like what new country would i start like that might even be part of the answer right like uh, i i like i personally yes. would start with a sure. city before a country by the way i mean i would uh, like a city locate a city located in a country that has enough of the right um you know law properties to get the uh, 80 the 80 20 of that right but like like trying to like actually um you know t- tweak the root of uh you know of the legal system and like go at the sovereign level like that's both it's a very difficult and it's a very challenging project and there's just like all kinds of international diplomatic risks that uh, you don't really want to get into unless you're fairly big right and so i think uh you know working with existing countries is just something that's going to realistically makes sense uh, for projects uh, going, I, sure. I, I think, uh, going into the future for a while, right? But uh, starting a new city in, but, and at the same time, like having the country aspects to the extent that you're creating a network effect in a country that, w- that would otherwise not have that network effect. Um, but one of the things that I would add in there is uh, definitely like have a stronger emphasis on like education as a part of the culture, right? Like imagine going through your entire life, like your living experience for your entire life being a uh, university at 10, at 10% intensity, right? So not a university at hundred percent intensity, but, you know, keep it at 10% uh, at 10% intensity, have like very um, easy and like very socially available opportunities yes. to constantly keep learning new things. Um, it, have, it's funny uh, you say this because basically, sorry, um, I didn't mean to cut you off, but like the, uh, it's like buying a car, a college education is like buying a car and not budgeting for maintenance over your life. The entire cost is up front and then you have no mm-hmm. gas or oil change. And then people are like, oh, I studied right. and like studied for four years and doesn't remember any of it. This extremely expensive install of ostensibly education that is, has zero maintenance associated with it, you know? No, anyway, go ahead. So I'm agreeing with you. Learning, I think, um, especially in the yeah, fast changing world that we're in, like it really is something that should be a lifelong process, right? It's uh, like, it, and especially once we, uh, you know, solve uh, longevity, I think, uh, I forget, either Aubrey de Grey or someone else talked about this, that like historically the pattern has been um, study, work, retire, but the yeah, new pattern might be study, work, retire, study, work, retire, stu- uh, study, work, study, mm-hmm. retire, work, retire, study, work, study. Um, and, but the yeah, other approach, of course, is to like really integrate the two more and that like studying should uh, not even necessarily yeah, be a phase. It should just be like a regular part of your life. Right. But so the social aspect is important. Right. And I think, uh, like one of my yeah, number one advices to like probably young people and all people everywhere is to be intentional about the social environment and, um, you know, to have, to have friends that help you bring out the virtues that you want to see in yourself um, is uh, something that I like. I just think that's so hugely uh, important, right? Like, you're there's just all kinds of subconscious ways in which your behavior changes for the better when you're around people. It's, fun- but also it's funny because the way to prove that to people is just actually AI prompts. Like, the prompt is so insanely important, and so you're just getting effectively prompted in a sensory fashion by. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. They're lifting weights. I should probably go and do that too. Like as a small example, or, oh, they're studying math. Oh yeah. Let me take a look at that. So like the prompts that you surround yourself with both digitally and physically have like such an influence on you and that, and one of them is like your social network. It's such an obvious thing, but people don't usually think about it. Exactly. Yeah. But I think, uh, you know, until you can, uh, you know, until we have multiple of these, um, established, uh, intentional communities and all of this, uh, whether they're you know creating new cities or new um, or new countries or um, you know new uh, Bitcoin monasteries or you know whatever people in that camp are trying to create or whatever, it's uh, like things that you can do while you're by yourself. Um, yeah, you know, I think uh, like motivation as the number one problem is uh, I think uh, one of the key uh, lessons that I've learned. And uh, there are like less not social ways to get that too, right? So like 
one of my personal experiences, right, is that like I've used uh, Duolingo for a while. I mean, I've you know used that uh, as uh, one of my yeah, ways to kind of uh, um, practice on my yeah, Spanish uh, for a while. Have uh, you know also experimented with some of the other East Asian languages with it too, and it's uh, like the way that the app prods you into like just trying like. Uh, into doing at least one thing every day. And the way that the app makes you like even feel the fear of, uh, you know, losing a multi hundred day streak. Um, if you uh, decide to go away from it, like it's stupid. And it's like, so obviously, um, you know, gamified in a, in a way that even seems a little bit trashy, but like for me, it works somehow. Like it, uh, though there are limits to it. Right. So like one of the yeah, things that, uh, well, just to kind of go down the path of Duolingo in particular, um, that I found and that other people have found is that it pushes you to optimize not for the game of knowing the language, but for the game of uh, winning Duolingo, right? Like, for example, sometimes Duolingo gives you a task, like translate this sentence. And like maybe about 20% of the time, you don't even need to look at what's at the top of the screen, like the yes sentence in Spanish or whatever. You just like go down, you look at the list of words that they give you to select from. And there just obviously is one sentence that in, in, in English you can construct from those words. And so you look at the bottom of the screen, you just like tap that sentence and you're done, right? And like you've won the game, but you haven't lear actually learned any Spanish. Yeah, so I do think it's uh, like important to mix other tools. I mean, I could actually tell you the yeah, path that I yeah, took to uh, learn uh, Chinese. Um, so, I, so at the beginning, I yeah, started with uh, Pimsleur. That's P I M S L E U R. It's this uh, set of online course. Uh, well, um, basically audio courses, right? So it's like a thirty-minute like base uh, course that for. And they have 90 of them, right? And you go through them and um, you know, it gets you up to a very basic level, right? So I think different people might have different experiences, but for, like, for me personally, you know, there's this kind of, on, there's this stereotype that exists online that like, it's possible to somehow pick up languages just by like, you know, going into a country and eventually kind of pick up words. And uh, obviously two-year-old kids can do it. And possibly extroverts can do it, but I totally can't, right? Like if you just like stuck me into China with no training, possibly yeah, after, even after 20 years, I would not like, you know, quote, pick up Chinese from zero. I would just be miserable. And, uh, but so for me personally, you know, for the first stage of learning languages, like, you know, you need the structured stuff. So I use Pimsor. Um, I also used uh, some uh, flashcard apps to learn the characters. And then once you get pat, um, above a certain point, there's like a certain level of like medium comprehension where that's the point where you can start picking the language up from, right? So before medium, um, you know, you start with the, uh, you know, the podcasts. Um, I did Pimsor. I think I did a Chinese pod and a couple of others. Um, once uh, you, you know, get past that point with the yeah, flashcard apps, then you go, like, like for me personally, you know, and I actually yeah, spent like a, a total of uh, about one and a half years in China and, uh, you know, some time in Taiwan and uh, you know, some time in, in uh, Singapore and just like a lot of time talking to uh, just like other Chinese friends that I had outside of China. And uh, it's once you get to that level, then you actually can just like keep learning by, by just talking to people, right? So talking to people. Um, and this is, ironically enough, actually, there's one particular way in which Chinese is easier than languages um, like, um, you know, German, for example, uh, which is that uh, if you try to speak in uh, in English to, or if you try to speak in, in broken German to someone in Germany, very often they <laughs> very quickly switch to English. Right? So you don't get and those training wheels in China. Like yeah. this might part. Right. Exactly. You don't get the training wheels, right? But like in Chinese, oh, no, no, no. You know, there's uh, lots of people who barely speak English at all. And like, they're, they'll be happy to try their, their best to understand you. Um, actually Spanish as well, um, as well. It's like, I think in maybe in Spain, a bit more English speakers, but in like deep Latin America, um, you know, definitely lots of people whose um, English is uh, very bad. And uh, you can definitely, yeah. And get your Spanish up there, especially if uh, if you try, right? But like, past the other thing that I did in China is like, you just like walk around the city and you look at street signs. And the street signs, they all have the name of the street in Chinese characters, and then the name of the street in Pinyin, right? That gives you the pronunciation. And so you just like look at street names and you passively learn a whole bunch of characters, just like as part of your life, right? So. 
like basically, yeah, yeah. So to get from like zero to mid, um, you know, you do the podcasts, so you do the flashcard apps, you do the like very structured courses, and then to get from mid to high, that's when like picking up things up and the, and the more social approach. Um, that's that's a good combination. So basically, if you're an adult, to summarize, if you're an adult, don't just start with immersion. Do courses to bootstrap yourself to that basic level. Get your BIOS up and running, and then you can kind of assimilate content. Mm. If you're two years old, you might just be able to be dumped in, right? Exactly. Yeah. And then for technology, um, that for like things like cryptography, for example, um, I, one of my lessons has been the importance of learning by doing, right? Like if you just, um, you know, if you just read and listen, there's just, it's just so easy to kind of go, you know, in one ear or, uh, or one eye and out the other. Um, but, uh, if you actually make yourself build the thing, that's the way that like you actually kind of get the knowledge into muscle memory. Like you, you work with the concepts with your brain in a, a much uh, deeper way. You ever heard of Shams outlines? It's basically like I have very similar uh, Shams outlines are pretty famous in India. Basically are these yellow outline books where they just have solved problems. They just go straight to solve problems. And so you just go straight to the exercises and there's like relatively minimal introduction. You just go straight to exercise. Just like, just start working out, not reading about working out. You work out, you know, and that's similar to this where basically by coding, coding it, by building it and then trying to break it, you understand it in a way that just the theory alone, reading about it doesn't get you something. No, that's actually fascinating. Like if you try trying to, the idea of teaching people even without content, but, but, but by just like, repeatedly giving them exercises that are like one inference step away from the previous exercise that they solved. Regardless of, I mean, what specific tool you use, I think uh, if you learn, if you want to learn about snarks, build a snark. If you uh, want to learn about how Ethereum works, build an Ethereum app, uh, implementation and get it to pass uh, some of the tests uh, or maybe even get to a point where it passes all the tests. And then um, if you want to learn about like homomorphic encryption, build an implementation of homomorphic encryption, right? Like if you want to learn about AI, then like actually, yeah, you know, build a, yeah, a neural network that's like, you know, at least powerful enough to do some like basic job of recognizing digits or whatever, right? That's, uh, I think it's one of the things that helped me. Um, in uh, 2011, I went through it's some of the yeah, machine learning course on, I, I forget the, the, there was one in Udacity and one in Coursera that was one by one was by Andrew, right? One yep. was by Sebastian Thrun, one was by Andrew Ng. And uh, they were very hands-on, right? Where like you had to actually implement, you know, a lot of like things like A star um, search, uh, search algorithms and like implement, uh, you know, multi-layer neural networks and all of those things. So actually implementing a thing and just like gives you this very deep and, and uh, hands-on understanding about like what the thing is and uh, you know how to work with it. It just gets intuitions that you can't get by just reading a textbook. Um, so highly, uh, you know, encourage taking an experiential approach. Um, you know, definitely, it's uh, the uh, you know, I think there it's the equivalent of like the the Star Wars uh, kind of like a, a kind of Jedi tradition where you're supposed to build your own lightsaber, right? It's do or do not, there's no try except for the <laughs> yeah, Merkel Patricia try, which, by the way, you should actually okay. do and implement. That's um, a good one. That's a good but, one. Uh, so lesson, you know, build your own um, people, um, laws, and uh, um, and the land. Um, you know, sacrifice quantity of network effects, go for quality. Um, you know, get the uh, get the right group of people. Um, you know, be modest on law, uh, on law, especially, um, especially at first. Um you know, provide, focus on the public goods motivation. Um, if you want to learn about things, then, um, you know, go and build your own lightsaber. And uh, I think, uh, awesome. yeah, lots of stuff for people to do. Thanks for coming on, Vitalik. And this is the first episode of the Network State Podcast.